Hello everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from and welcome back to the GU Car Studio. Uh, we are thrilled to bring you the next PCF Prostic webinar. Uh, I'm Dr. Renu Epen, urologist at the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre here in Melbourne. Um, this is a great collaboration between the US Prostate Cancer Foundation, Prostic, the Prostate Imaging and Theranostic Centre of Excellence here in Melbourne and the International Cancer Imaging Society. And I am thrilled to be joined by my co-host uh, for this uh, webinar, uh, the legendary Professor Michael Hoffman, a nuclear medicine physician and director of Prostic. Uh, welcome back, Michael. Thanks, Renu, and thanks for co-hosting. <laughs> you know, every time I welcome you back to the GUCAR studio, I'm reminded of the fact that you were our very first guest oh, on the podcast. Very special. And we discussed pro PSMA, and look how far we've come since then. We have got to thank COVID for that. <laughs> so today we have a really multidisciplinary panel. Uh, I'm a urologist, you're a nuclear medicine physician, but we're missing a medical oncologist. I think we should get one. We should get one. And uh, you, your wish is our command because we have Dr. Louise Costos, a medical oncologist from Peter Mac, here joining us. Welcome, Louise. Thanks, Renu. Perfect timing. <laughs> Louise is doing a PhD with Prostic and is really the secret behind many of our clinical trials, Lucab, Violet, Alphabet. Most of those protocols were written by Louise yeah, and Co. Secrets exposed. Yeah. So it's going to be a great, um, a great webinar uh, this time. Um, lots, a huge panel joining us, and, and we'll introduce everyone gradually. Um, but I think we should introduce our main guest for the for the event. The main guest? Who's that? <laughs> <laughs> There's so many. She's flying solo today, okay. um, but it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Andrea Miyahira uh, to this webinar uh, from the Prostate Cancer Foundation. Andrea, good to have you join us. Well, thank you, Renu and, and the Peter Mack team for putting this wonderful, wonderful webinar, webinar together. together. So, so I'm Andrea Miyahira here representing PCF. PCF. I'm the Senior, Senior Director, Director of Global Research, Research and Scientific Communications. communications. Um, um, I, just I just wanted, wanted to, to say a few words about PCF and Prostic. PCF has been funding PSMA and Theranostics research for 30 years. It's been very exciting just to see these past few years, the field is finally blossoming with Bluvicto, PSMA PET, and any other new Theranostics targets that are now under investigation. Today, PCF has funded over 60 million US dollars on Theranostics research, mostly on PSMA, and now we're looking at new targets as well. This includes the establishment of Prostic at the Peter Mac. We've been so proud to see the accomplishment of this team leading critical diagnostics trials and educational initiatives like these global webinars and the in-person uh, preceptorships. In 2022, we also established a tactical award program and an international team led by Michael was awarded one of these to develop new lead-based alpha particle mediating radiologic therapies, targeting a, targeting a range of new um, targets. So we're very excited about this. Anyway, I'm excited to learn from our colleagues on the call today, and especially about how Theranostics is being practiced across Asia. Thank you, Andre. I mean, it's amazing the outreach that the PCF has, and uh, it's been such a leader in so many of the innovations that have, that have occurred in, in Theranostics over the last few years. Yeah, it's, it, we've had incredible support from PCF, and uh, you've really helped accelerate the Peter Mac program, so we're very Grateful. Uh, for those online, this we are going to make this interactive. So there is a and a button at the bottom of your Zoom webinar interface. And you can type in a question, uh, such as Declan, who asked, would you like to be a urologist? <laughs> uh, and you can upvote other people's questions. And that's how we'll prioritise the questions that we answer. We've also pre-prepared a few questions that we'll get your votes on. The theme of today's webinar is bringing lutetium PSMA earlier. I think we're trying to bring it from a last line to a first line treatment. And we have an incredible number of registrants. We've done it in a different time zone. Usually we get up at 5am to do this for a European American time zone. This is much better, Renu, don't you it, think? It really is, isn't 1 it? 1pm. It's, uh... it's lunchtime in Australia. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we have a thousand plus registrants from 67 countries. And it is a different distribution than our previous webinars because of this time. So you can see the first three actually had over 50, and number three is Korea. We, I think we had like 80 registrants from Korea, followed by India, Pakistan, Taiwan. So we have got lots of people from around Asia, which is fantastic. And we've introduced all our Asian panel members after our keynote speakers. Absolutely. Here's a map, and you can mm -hmm. see there, has, there is a good concentration in Asia. And uh, this is what people associated themselves with, mainly nuclear medicine 
physicians and specialists, followed by industry. Louise, yeah. I would have thought more medical oncologists would have uh, registered. I know. I'm not sure what's happened there. I think we're all just too busy in the middle of clinic seeing patients. <laughs> We've got this more nurses true. than medical oncologists. Oh, and I they're think dedicated we, to the job. <laughs> if we compare this to previous webinars, the standout to me is the rise in nurses joining, over you know, almost 50 registered, and consumers and patients. It yeah. is also important to note, although it's excellent to have the consumers uh, participating in these webinars, we can't provide any personalised medical information, so patients should uh, speak to their doctors if they do have any specific questions. But it's great that there is so much uh, interest from such a multidisciplinary audience. Great. Uh, let's go. Shall we kick off? We might kick off. All right. So our first speaker um, for this webinar is Professor Louise Emmett. Uh, she's a nuclear medicine physician and director of theranostics at St. Vincent's Hospital in Sydney. And she's going to tell us about the NZP trial, which is looking at the synergistic effects um, uh, with a combination of enzalutamide and lutetium PSMA. So Louise, over to you. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much for having me on the webinar and uh, great to be able to talk uh, about NCP. So NCP is a, um, a phase two randomized trial, a uh, theranostics trial, pre-chemotherapy in the metastatic cancer resistant space that was run by ANZAP clinical trials um, at 15 centres across Australia and has currently um, had an interim readout with an overall survival readout to be due later this year. It's looking at enzalutamide alone versus enzalutamide plus lutetium PSMA in MCRPC pre-chemo. So we know that both uh, lutetium PSMA 617 and um, enzalutamide improve overall survival in uh, prostate cancer, in metastatic prostate cancer. Um, but when you look, um, if you could just uh, pass to the next slide, Michael. Oh, that'd be great. So when you look in the PREVAIL trial, which is enzalutamide pre-chemotherapy for metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer, there's a significant proportion of patients that fail quite early, even though we know it's a very active agent. So the rationale or the idea of um, NZP was to see if we could add lutetium PSMA to enzalutamide, with enzalutamide being the key treatment, um, as an adjunct extra therapy to see if it actually improved outcomes in these patients with um, poor risk good. disease. Uh, we know um, from previous work that we've done that you do get this really nice interaction between the androgen receptor and the PSMA receptor in the prostate cancer cell. And in MCRPC, you actually get this upregulation of PSMA uh, when you add an, um, an ARSI. So the idea of um, NCP is that you have um, different clonal populations which will have different sensitivities, some to ARSI, some to lutetium PSMA. The nice thing about when you start um, enzalutamide with metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer, you actually get upregulation um, of PSMA expression in some cells, particularly those androgen resistant cells. We need very bright um, up a PSMA activity in order to get good treatment response uh, with PSMA targeted yeah, agents. So if we make them brighter, we get better cell kill. We get left with a cell population that's lower PSMA expression likely to respond to ARSI for longer. So that's the rationale of NCP. The rationale of NCP is that you get left with this clonal population uh, that will respond to um, ARSIs for longer with the use of lutetium. So NCP, uh, it, the eligibility was metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer, pre-chemotherapy with a rising PSA and two risk factors for early treatment failure um, on enzalutamide alone. Needed to have a positive PSMA PET. Um, and primary endpoint was PSA progression-free survival with other progression-free survival and overall survival and health-related quality of life, key other endpoints. Patients were randomised one-to-one to, -one to either enzalutamide or enzalutamide plus, either two or four doses of lutetium PSMA. So looking at the screening criteria, it was just a PSMA PET. We didn't use diagnostic CT or F. DG and had a very simple enrolment screening criteria with an SUV max of 15 at a single site and 10 at all sites of measurable disease. And then patients needed two risk factors for early treatment failure on enzalutamide alone. We used adaptive dosing with the NCP trial uh, and there was a lot of imaging undertaken within the trial itself. So all patients got a baseline PSMA PET for screening 
They had a translational um, PSMA pet at day 15 after commencing enzalutamide. Um, and then on the experimental arm, two doses of lutetium PSMA with uh, spec CT undertaken at each time point. And then all patients on both arms had a day 92 PSMA PET CT and the interim PET. For the experimental arm, this was used to determine whether a patient did or did not get an extra two doses of lutetium PSMA. In this case, the patient had no residual disease on their day 92 PSMA PET, so they did not get further doses of lutetium PSMA. They just continued on, on enzalutamide. This patient had, um, uh, so their baseline day 15 PET, first two doses of SPECT, and then on their day 92 PSMA PET scan, you can see they had residual disease. So this patient went on and got another two doses of lutetium PSMA based on residual disease on the interim PET. All patients also had PSMA and FDG PET at first progression, whether that was radiographic or PSA um, progression. So we have at this interim analysis that's been presented, we had 220 patients who were screened, 162 patients randomised, 79 to enzalutamide and 83 to the combination. There was an 18% screening failure rate. Um, and at the time of an, this interim analysis, 16 patients remained on trial on the enzalutamide alone arm and 32 patients on the combination arm. Looking at the adaptive dosing, 81% of patients received all four doses of lutetium PSMA and medium follow-up um, at the time of uh, this presentation is 20 months. So the primary endpoint was PSA progression-free survival and that was strongly positive with a hazard ratio of 0.43. So 7.8 month progression-free survival for enzalutamide and 13 months for enzalutamide plus lutetium PSMA. When we look at radiographic progression-free survival, um, the hazard ratio was 0.67 and it was 12 months progression-free survival for enzalutamide and 16 months for enzalutamide plus lutetium PSMA. We did have a problem with RPFS. Um, so we had a large number of patients on the enzalutamide alone arm who were censored um, on this analysis because they came off trial um, after first progression and didn't get confirmation on the CT and the bone scan. And I think this is a really important part of NZP, an unexpected side effect of having lots of PSMA PET built into the trial itself. Uh, we ran into problems with radiographic progression-free survival. It's probably not very, very interpretable. PSA 50% response rate was much deeper with the combination, 93% compared to 68%. Uh, and 90% PSA response rates were 37% for enzalutamide and 78% with the combination. So in summary, this is the first randomised trial combining an ARSI enzalutamide with lutetium PSMA 617. Uh, it provides strong evidence for enhanced anti-cancer activity on its primary endpoint, PSA progression-free survival, 7.8 versus 13 months. It's an active life-prolonging treatment for the control group, which I think is important. Uh, it is the first trial that uses adaptive dosing of lutetium PSMA based on an interim PSMA PET. And I, I think this is a really nice way to give lutetium PSMA. It has the potential to reduce toxicity by only administering if we have persistent PSMA avid disease present. And I think this is going to be important as we move it earlier. We only gave two or four doses, but two to six doses would probably further improve progression-free survival if we're going to do it again. There is planned follow-up of progression-free and overall survival. The cut is at July 2024, and we will have survival data later this year. Um, and there is an extensive embedded translational imaging liquid biopsy program for biomarker analysis, and that is funded um, as part of a PCF Challenge Award. So thanks so much for PCF. That's going to be really interesting to look at. Um, and you can see here the translational component here. We have uh, multiple pets uh, at serial time points with CTC, so circulating tumour cells, which were sent living cells sent directly to Singapore and then the US as they were drawn and CT DNA. So we're going to get a lot of information um, to come. Thank you. And just thanking everyone uh, involved in the trial, particularly ANZ up CTC and Movember. Thanks so much, Louise. Uh, as always, that was an excellent presentation. And I think the NZP trial really answers so many questions. Uh, first of all, can we use lutetium PSMA? earlier in the carcerate resistance space, but also is there a role for combination therapies, which 
Uh, I'm sure we'll talk about later on in the webinar. I just wanted to remind everyone, we will go through any questions after all of the presentations. So please feel free to put any questions in the chat uh, if you do have any, or we can have a discussion once the presentations are finished. Uh, I'd like to welcome Professor Kong as our next speaker. Professor Kong is a clinician scientist as well as a professor and director of radiology in Singapore. And she'll speak briefly about the International Cancer Imaging uh, Society conference happening this year in Singapore, which she is the co-host of. So welcome, Professor Kong. Thank you so much. On behalf of the ICIS, thank you for this opportunity to co-host and thank you for this airtime. Uh, so shall I share the slides myself or? Um... Yeah, I think that'll work best actually. Okay, I'll do that. Okay. Right, so, yeah. oops. Somehow runs on its own, interesting. Uh, maybe I'll just do this then. That looks good if you just go to your full screen mode. Yeah, but it tends to have its life of its own. I'll, I'll just do this on the full screen mode. Anyway, I, I, um, I'm I delighted as a president of the ICIS to welcome you to Singapore for the uh, 23rd edition of the ICIS. And uh, it will be held on the 27th to the 29th of September in uh, the Shangri-La Hotel in Singapore. And um, it's uh, the ICIS annual teaching course, um, as I said, is on the 23rd edition, and it's, we've organized course um, in various countries uh, through the years, uh, predominantly it's in London and uh, in Europe. And two years ago, it was uh, first held in the USA, and this year, it will be the first time in Asia that we will be hosting the uh, ICIS annual teaching course. Um, so, um, also um, different from previous years is that this will be a joint uh, conference uh, together with the Singapore Radiological Society and the College of Radiologists in Singapore. So the meeting will have a focus on cancer imaging, but uh, also be comprehensive covering uh, other aspects of radiology, um, including interventional radiology and uh, allied health groups. So the ICIS is um, uh, exists to advance imaging in multidisciplinary management of cancer by promoting education in oncological imaging. And uh, the theme for the 2024 meeting is illuminating cancer care. And we will aim to highlight the evolving role of imaging and intervention in modern clinical practice. And uh, in our content of our um, um, program, we have uh, three keynotes three plenary sessions. So the three keynotes uh, will cover multi-omics of diagnosis and management, uh, raise the issues of our global oncology workforce challenges, and then a, a global topic about reach out to outreach to LMICs. The plenaries will, uh, in the theme of the meeting, cover illuminating um, uh, precision oncology, and uh, you would recognize uh, one of the uh, speakers in this plenary session, none other than Dr. Michael Hoffman. And then we will have another plenary on cancer biomarkers and integrated diagnostics. And the third one on digital oncology and AI for augmenting patient care. I just want to highlight also that uh, we will, apart from these, we will have educational talks, um, scientific sessions, and hands-on workshops. So there will be one on prostate cancer, uh, that will be uh, conducted by Professor Anwar Padani. So we are outreaching to, uh, to participants. I think for many of you, it might just be a stone throw away. Uh, we are outreaching to diagnostic interventional radiologists, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, nuclear medicine physicians, of course, as we will also cover molecular imaging and theranostics, scientists, students, and our allied health professionals. So I look forward to welcoming you to Singapore for the ICIS. Uh, we will have our early bird registration and abstract open on the 28th of February to coincide with the ECR. And uh, our website uh, will be simply ICIS-SGCR-Wires, uh, which will be officially launched then. And this is our International Cancer Imaging Society website. So thank you very much for that time. And I hope to see you, many of you in Singapore soon in September. Thank you. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Professor Kong. That was a great summary and it, it looks like it's shaping up to a great meeting. So hopefully uh, lots of people will join and we certainly do encourage everyone to try and attend in Singapore at the Shangri-La. It's, it's a really great teaching course. There's not a lot of radiology, nuclear medicine uh, meetings that are focused on cancer imaging. Often you've got, if you go to a radiology meeting, you'll get musculoskeletal stroke, a bit of everything. But to focus on cancer imaging is actually really important. I think it's a unmet need as a, in an imaging uh, meeting. And uh, ICIS has really been pivotal over the last few decades of having that as a specialty uh, within imaging. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael and Thank you. All right. We are flying through. Next up, we have Professor Oliver Sartor. Now, Oliver is a medical oncologist, but really an honorary nuclear medicine physician. He needs no introduction. <laughs> uh, I think he's led really most of the phase three industry large trials, all the way from the Alsimka trial of radium 223, probably even earlier ones that you'll tell us about that I'm not even aware of, Oliver, uh, all the way through to the vision trial, uh, which has led to global approval and availability of uh, Pluvicto. And Oliver is going to uh, give us a summary of the findings of the PSMA4 trial, which was presented at uh, ESMO uh, last year. Uh, Oliver, are you able to share your screen for the slides? And if you can't, sure. I can do it on my side, but it may work better if you do it on your side and then just... Well, let's, let's uh, try it on this screen. side and, and see what it looks like. And and so let's see, I uh, am hopefully beginning to share. You are. If you just go right slideshow now. and start and the slideshow, I think I'm that'll be perfect. I'm going to put it on slideshow here in just a moment from the beginning. How does that look? Fire away. Okay. Um, first of all, um, thank you, Michael, and for all your colleagues at Peter Mac. And uh, thank you to PCF, because PCF just makes so many things possible. Uh, it was rather interesting uh, to hear they've been funding PSMA research for 30 years. I think that's pretty remarkable. Um, you know, what we have here is a little bit of an opportunity to look at the PSMA 617 Letitium earlier in the treatment paradigm. And I'm going to be presenting some data that was initially presented at the presidential symposium in Madrid. And whenever, you know, it's me talking, there are so many others who have contributed. And I don't need to call them all out by name, but I'm simply going to say Novartis was the sponsor. They really put it together. Uh, it is a global series of investigators a really widespread steering committee, a lot of expertise goes into a phase three. My privilege to be able to present to you this evening. Now, what is PSMA4? So PSMA4, phase three, randomized, again, Lutetium 177, PSMA617 versus an RP change, that's an receptor pathway inhibitor, taxi naive patients, with PSMA positive metastatic CRPC. Now, I don't want to go through all the details on eligibility, but let's just say we use vision criteria for selecting the patients by PSMA. The randomization was one to one, and crossover was allowed once you encountered the blinded independent central review RPFS endpoint. So Bicker, blinded independent central review, was absolutely critical, and crossover is absolutely critical when interpreting this trial. Now, primary endpoint, RPFS. Well, I thought it was sort of interesting that Louise, in her beautiful slides, presented a hazard ratio of 0 0.43, so I might as well do the same. Here we got 0 0.43 again. By the way, it's the second interim analysis, actually, the median was 12.02 months, and that's in the lutetium arm, versus 5.59 in the RP switch arm. And clearly, you can see those confidence intervals don't even come close to overlapping. And I'll simply say this is very statistically significant, not necessarily a surprise. Now, the radiographic response rates, this is resist criteria. So not everybody's looked at, only those people with manageable disease. 
And if you add up the complete responses, which are about 21%, and the partial responses, you get a little over 50% on objective response. I think that's really good. That compares to about 14.9% in the controller. Now, if you say waterfall plots, it's good and bad news here. Clearly, you can see that the logician on the left-hand side is better than the control group, but confirmed decreases 57.6%. Goodness gracious, that may pale in comparison to ends of P, 93% in the intent to treat. Now, there's a lot of differences. It's not just the utilization of enzalutamide in, in the lutetium arm. Uh, there's also a little bit of a difference that all of our patients were pretreated with an ARPI, whereas in hers, that wasn't necessarily true. Nevertheless, we see clear distinctions in the lutetium and the control group. Now, we do have an overall survival analysis to present, but it's relatively immature. Hazard ratio 1.16. That's more than one. You want to see it less than one. But I do want to point out a very important fact. 84% of the patients who were eligible for crossover actually did. That's enormously high. 84% went from the control arm to the lutetium. So this is not necessarily ever going to be positive for survival with that degree of crossover. The median OS of about 19 months in each arm is pretty immature. Look at the events. There are only 69 events in the lutetium arm, 65 events in the arm change arm, and that's only about 29 or 28 percent of the actual number of patients enrolled on the trial. I think we have to conclude this is a pretty early look at overall survival, and we shouldn't make a lot of conclusions, but remember that crossover of 84 percent. Now, one of the things that was interesting as we looked at those bad treatment aversion adverse events, grade three, four, the serious adverse events. And guess what? Lower in the lutetium arm than in the hormonal arm. I think this was stunningly safe. If you look at dose adjustments, 3.5% of the patients enrolled in lutetium had a dose adjustment as compared to 15% on the hormonal arm. That's, again, pretty striking. Discontinuation rate's about the same as 5.7%. Good safety, bottom line, very good safety. Now, let's go earlier for a second with the PSMA addition study design. And this is hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. So this trial has completed accrual. We don't have any results yet. And basically, it's metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, randomized to standard of care. In this case, standard of care means ADT and an RP, plus lutetium or minus lutetium. Primary radiographic progression-free survival, primary endpoint with a crossover on RPFS. And then, of course, long-term follow-up. So no data on this, but the theme is moving the lutetium earlier. Well, here's an example, an example of that. Now, this is a trial that I'm a little bit enamored with, and that's because we're going to try to do lutetium in a phase three trial, hormone-sensitive, but no hormonal therapy. We're going to try to avoid castration. The name of the trial is PSMA DC. DC mean is delayed castration. So these are patients with PSMA PET-positive disease, but negative conventional imaging. All the lesions have to be amenable to SBRT. We're going to take up to five lesions. Has to be metastatic, by the way. PSA doubling time of less than or equal to 10 months. And all of these patients are previously pre-treated with a radical or radiation therapy to remove the prostate from being an issue. Non-castrate T at baseline randomized between SPRT plus or minus lutetium. Primary endpoint, MFS conventional imaging, is, that is metastatic free survival conventional imaging. That is an FDA approvable endpoint. If we get this done, it's a positive trial, this will really change practice. So I'm hoping that it might be true. So what's the optimal time for PSMA ready ligand therapy? Number one, 
I think when you provide clinically meaningful improvements as compared to a standard of care, that's a good way to think about it. But we really need to concentrate on getting a regulatory approval based on those endpoints. And that way, the results can really change practice. If we get the FDA and the regulators to be able to say thumbs up, that's when things really change. I think it's also interesting and important to think about reasonable alternatives to the castration and chemotherapy paradigm that our patients just don't like. I think it's time for us to do better. So let's give it some good thought. Thank you very much, Michael, for the opportunity to present today. That's all of us. Uh, you can stop sharing your screen. That was a fantastic talk. And uh, I like your concluding insights. Uh, we might throw to an audience question. Uh, let me get the first poll up. Uh, Louise Costos has put this question together. So I'm going to let her ask it. So you'll see a question on your screen. You don't have to answer it. If you don't feel you have the knowledge to answer it, don't click. But if you feel you can, then go for it. Yeah, so I think it's really interesting. Uh, each country has different ways of accessing lutetium PSMA and therefore it does seem to be sequenced differently depending on uh, where you're living. So we thought it'd be interesting for people to vote based on your local practice. Where would you normally sequence lutetium PSMA for your patients? Is it normally as per vision after a taxane and at least one novel hormonal agent? Uh, like therapy, so prior to cabazitaxel, but after docetaxel and an NHA, or before a taxane, like in the PSMA4 study, or there, is there anyone out there doing it prior to first-line novel hormonal agent or docetaxel? Thanks, Louise. We do have about 450 people online, which is pretty cool. It's incredible. Uh, and, you know, about 20% have voted, so I think that's a good... Good number. We might end the poll and see what the answer is. Most people are 60% are using it uh, per vision. post carbazitaxel, 34% uh, prior to carbazitaxel, which is kind of our practice now, Peter Mac, would you say? Yeah, I'd say. I think that's also reassuring because globally, cabazitaxel generally does have low uptake, at least in the public healthcare sector. I think my, uh, many patients, I think under 30% actually are exposed to cabazitaxel. So I guess it's reassuring that it appears clinicians are still considering cabazitaxel for patients. And certainly that's our practice locally at Peter Mac. And we do want to throw to our expert panel Absolutely. Through, around Asia, Asia right? I might, we might introduce them one by one and throw them questions. Okay. <laughs> we might start with uh, Singapore, Dr. Su Ping Tang, who's a senior uh, nuclear medicine physician at Singapore General Hospital, spent time at Peter Mac as a therapy fellow some years ago, back when we were doing our phase two, very first trial and treated some of the first patients, probably in Australia or even globally with lutetium PSMA. What's the current practice in Singapore? When, when, when do you choose to use lutetium? Thanks, Micah, for having me here today. I think in Singapore, it is um, mostly after ARPI, uh, but not necessarily after chemotherapy. Um, I, I, we started this treatment uh, right after we have learned this uh, from you, you know, and your team from Peter Mac in 2017. And as of today, we have treated around 200 over patients, delivered 800 over cycles. We did a short an, uh, uh, some analysis of some of our patients sometime last year, and around 40% of our patients uh, are actually uh, chemo naive. Although uh, individual, although our multivariate analysis does not show that these patients who are chemo naive uh, do have a better outcome compared to those uh, the, the other arm. Uh, but individual patients' experience, uh, some of the longest survivor patients uh, at our center are, uh, are chemo naive, basically. Yeah, Very I think it would be really fascinating to look at the subgroup analysis of um, SPLASH, looking at the taxane naive patients. SPLASH is a, another trial uh, we're yet to see the final results of looking at uh, giving lutetium PSMA earlier on and also um, the final results of the PSMA4 study, uh, patients who were taxane naive, but certainly it seems like uh, at least before docetaxel, but after a novel hormonal agent seems to um, be very promising and likely will be 
the new standard of care, depending on you know the readout of all of these important trials. Shall we do another question? We yep. should. Another poll, you mean? Another poll. We might yeah. launch the yeah. poll. This one's about... How to patients. Yes, that's a good one. Yeah, so access is really interesting in Australia because we currently uh, do not have widespread access. We're very lucky at Peter Mac patients can come here and access Lutetian PSMA on a compassionate access program or clinical trials. And there are other centres becoming uh, available where patients can self-fund Lutetian, but we're interested to see in your country generally how do patients access Lutetian PSMA? Is it self-funding trials? Is it reimbursed already, uh, either by insurance or by the government? And it looks like there's a there's a good split of about a quarter, a quarter, a quarter. I might just share these results. They should now pop up on your screen. I didn't do that last time. And you can see it's actually about an equal split. Uh, and I guess this probably varies from country to country. And if we could poll everyone on our panel, we'd probably find within each country, it's kind of a majority on trial or a majority uh, self-funding. But there are some parts of the world, like India, where lutetian PSMA has been available for uh, for really a very, very long time. And patients have, have flown there from all parts of the world sometimes to access uh, lutetian, a bit like flying to Germany in the early days. So I wonder if we cross to Professor Ballinger Singh, who... Uh, is from the PGM UR in Chandigarh. I had the pleasure of going to the Indian Society of Nuclear Medicine meeting about 12 years ago now. Uh, and uh, uh, he's the ex president of the Society of Nuclear Medicine in India. Are you able to tell us about what's the current access of lutetian PSMA throughout India? Can you give us a bit of a feel for that? Oh, um, Daljinda, you're just muted there. You can just unmute yourself. Uh, yes, sorry. Bottom left. Perfect. We, we can hear you now. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Michael, I, I think you have been a very frequent visitor to India starting from 2010 and then World Congress, second Theranostic World Congress in Chandigarh. And uh, I mean, uh, you, as you requested me to present uh, the current diagnostic practices in India, I think uh, your question is now supply of repetition and PSMA in India. So we are we have indigenously produced repetition produced by our national agency, the BRC Baba Tomasa Center, and some of the cent centers in India also depend on the uh, import of repetition PSMA. I think. Uh, India is uh, doing good. We have been into lutetium PSMA therapy more than a decade, and the um, many, many new centers are coming up now and practicing these, uh, I mean, categorized therapies. But since India is a huge country, I think uh, uh, since, since many people are not covered by insurance, I think Indian government is taking a significant lead into setting up a, a dedicated nuclear direct reactor for the useful, clinically useful alpha and beta metals. I think with this coming in, uh, I think we will expand further the theranostic practices. But uh, looking at the size of the patient, volume of the patient requiring these therapies, I think we need to catch up with the rest of the world by escalating our indigenous production of these cutting edge therapies. We love having visitors from India to Peter Mac. And one of the amazing things is when people come out from India and see some of the things we do, within a few months they're doing it back in their yeah. back in their uh, institution. Whereas in other countries, sometimes they look at what we do and they go, "Well, we can't do that." <laughs> <laughs> there we go, innovator. Um, all right, so uh, we'll move on to Professor Yao Zhu, um, a good friend of ours at uh, GU Cast. Um, Zhu is a, a, an attending urologist at the Fudan uh, Cancer Center in Shanghai, uh, has a great interest in uh, prostate cancer theranostics in particular, and uh, previously attended our Peter Mack preceptorship, and will be attending the prostate preceptorship in March. Um, and he's led many investor, uh, investigator initiated trials. Uh, Zhu, what's the um, uh, what's the situation back home in Shanghai? And when do you sequence lutetium PSMA treatment? Is it after AR targeted therapies and before chemo or after chemo? What's the access like there? Uh, hi, Renu. Thanks for having me. 
uh, in Shanghai, we have most of the lutetium PSMA performed in the clinical trial setting. And our patients mostly enrolled those patients post chemo and post ARSI. But we do see some patients who have very nice response before the chemotherapy. So nowadays, uh, with the, our center is also a center uh, performing the PSMA4 study. So we are trying to move the, this kind of the treatment before the chemotherapy and the patients can have nice performance status and a nice response and a high quality of life. Fantastic. And, and what is the funding like for Letitian PSMA? Over there. Yeah, uh, I think most of like 80% of patients are enrolled in a clinical trial setting and the 20% of patients may have self-funded in mainland of China. I think a, another a really interesting question that we don't really have a definite answer to at the moment and really depends on how patients are accessing the treatment is how many cycles would you normally give? Because uh, I guess the PSMA4 study, there were six cycles of lutetium, whereas NZP, there's a more adaptive dosing appro approach where patients have two cycles and possibly a couple more depending on their response. So what would be the standard number of cycles that you would normally give in your country? Yeah, so what I learned from my, our nuclear radiologists is they are trying to give four to six cycles in our patients. And it's really depend on the response and the patient's uh, adverse events after this kind of treatment. Yeah, she was a true uh, urologist slash nuclear medicine physician. Fantastic. Yeah. Nuclear urologist. I'm launching another question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, about, another poll. Yeah. yeah, another poll. What percentage of patients are eligible for lutetium PSMA? Because medical oncologists... Nuclear medicine specialists, radiation oncologists, everyone uses a different threshold. I think it's fair to say that the strongest evidence base is from the vision trial, which uses a gallium 68 PSMA PET, and they had a threshold above liver, and also used the contrast enhanced CT. And if there were no lesions on the CT that didn't have PSMA uptake, then you were suitable. And then we ran our own therapy trial. We had a slightly Different threshold and SUV max over 20, and we used FDG PET as well. But here the question is, what percentage of patients are suitable in your practice or in your country based on whatever threshold you use? Just a gut feel, more than 90%, 70 to 90 or less than 70. What's your feel for Peter Mac? What's, what's our number about at the moment? I think we're still generally following more of a therapy eligibility. So we still screen patients with the PSMA as well as FDG PET scan. Uh, and generally we're looking for an SEV max of at least 20. So I, I think I'd say about 25% patients aren't eligible based not on eligible. imaging, are not eligible. Yeah. So around 75 are eligible. I think that's about right. And if we look at the poll results, which I will share, that's actually the uh, majority, although there's a big split here, 14%, say over 90%. That's a bit more vision-like or PSMA4-like, actually. 50% uh, 70 to 90 and in 40% less than 70%. That's a, that's actually, that's a little bit surprising. Yeah, because I'd say at, at Peter Mac, we follow quite strict criteria compared to other studies such as vision. So I would have thought our screen fail rate or ineligibility rate would probably be the highest. We might take that opportunity to shoot to, uh, to Taiwan. I had the pleasure of going to a Taiwanese meeting last year for the first time, and I met a lot of urologists, nuclear medicine physicians, and medical oncologists. It was fantastic. So we invited Dr. Yu Yi Huang uh, to join the panel. Uh, she's a nuclear medicine uh, physician in Taiwan. And her husband's a medical oncologist. What a good partnership, right? Excellent. And into GU medical oncology, even better. Uh, and and I, I think you are sort of leading access to lutetium PSMA in Taiwan at the moment. Can you give us a, a summary of the state of play at the moment? Okay. Thank you, Matt. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you, Michael. I, <laughs> we have uh, started the lutetium PSMA treatment since last year, uh, I don't know, uh, 2022. And we got a few patient experience because it's not reimbursed in Taiwan. So we uh, likely we have 15 patients and undergoing like 34 cycles in our institution. 
And, um, and for the uh, screening of the PISMA treatment, we we'll, we uh, take like vision uh, vision uh, criteria. So we probably have over 19 Ninety percent of patients would be eligible for this treatment, and and uh, specifically, we have a lot of old age patients, and they are not uh, suitable for chemotherapy. So most of our patients are chemo uh, were chemo naive, and uh, uh, some of them are really uh, really really severe in the late stage. So uh, about half of them cannot uh, make all the four to six cycles of treatment. So we got uh, like uh, like 30% of patients who can uh, finish over four or more cycles of tissue pisma treatment and uh, uh, like four, uh, thirty uh, 70% of them got, uh, this patient got a very good PSA response and a good quality of life. So I think the, the situation is uh, some kind of different in Taiwan because we treat most of our patients are very late stage. So yeah. uh, <laughs> we still ho hope we can do that treatment earlier in the disease status and not that, not that like now we are doing a very late stage patients. So that's oh, our yeah. here. I just wonder from Oliver Sartor in the USA at the moment, given, given the regulatory uh, approval, which is vision-like, which is post docetaxel If you have a elderly patient who's simply not suitable for docetaxel, not suitable for carbazitaxel, but highly suitable for lutetium, are, are you able to access Plavicto for that patient given that they're medically unsuitable for chemotherapy? Or is there a regulatory problem that because it's not approved in that setting, you simply cannot access it? Yeah, Michael, it's, you know, it's kind of interesting. It's not a regulatory issue as much as reimbursement issues. So in the United States, the regulators drive the reimbursement almost completely. So if you have an insurance company and you're trying to practice out of the scope of the regulations, and they're going to be encountering a $42,000 per dose expense, then most insurance companies say, not only no, they say, hell no. And intermittently, you might be able to get one through, but as a rule, the insurance companies follow the regulators and the insurance companies are designed to save money when they can. That's what they wanna do. Us, we wanna treat patients. So we're always knocking heads. We don't always agree with the insurance companies, but they have their rules and they follow them. And I'll simply say, it's a problem. Right. We have another question for the panel and it's around FDG. Yeah. So I guess, as I mentioned in Peter Mac, we, we are using FDG uh, to select patients and those who have clear discordant disease generally, we don't recommend uh, that they proceed with lutetium PSMA, but obviously in trials such as vision, uh, just a CT was used rather than an FDG PET. And I know uh, in Australia, at least it's not reimbursed for this uh, indication. We have an access program at Peter Mac, but that's quite unique. So we wanted to, I guess, put the question out there and, and ask in your practice, is anyone routinely using FDG PET or is it really just based on PSMA PET? And here are the results. I think uh, most people using it some of the time, 20% most of the time, 21% all of the time. I like that answer. <laughs> and 16% uh, never. Yep. Uh, again, a bit, a huge mix. Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a point of great shock when you when you travel around and you hear other people's experience because you know access to PSMA PET is not uniform around the world. Um, and here we are doing a PSMA PET and an FDG PET in order to give this treatment. But when you think about it, so a significant number of patients are self-funding this treatment. So it really is important to make sure that patients are going to benefit from it. Yeah, I think if we look at variation in outcomes, it's mostly driven by patient selection. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, perhaps as we move this treatment earlier and earlier, we need better and we need more patient selection rather than less. Mm -hmm. So if we have 90% suitable for vision, if we bring it through to first line, it's my belief that if we want to have successful trials, we probably need to be a bit more selective because if you've got low PSMA expression, 
you're probably not going to do well compared to some standard of care such as docetaxel, even if you don't like chemotherapy. So you're really going to have to select patients and personalise treatment a little bit more. Uh, I know Louise Emmett has some strong thoughts on this. Uh, Louise, do you want to uh, comment on that? So we're talking about uh, personalising treatment with adaptive dosing, both to intensify and to de-intensify treatment. And, you know, I think this idea of biomarker-guided treatment, where well, you've been doing it for years, Michael, uh, we all have, because we do the SPECT uh, and we do, some people do interim PET. Uh, but I do think we'll get better responses than we will just giving six doses, six weekly without any imaging at all. Uh, but definitely we need to show that in trial. I'd like to throw to another panel member uh, uh, from Korea, Professor Ilham Lim. He's director of the nuclear medicine department at the Korean Cancer Center uh, and also president of the Theranostics Research Group of the Korean Society of Nuclear Medicine. Good to know they have a Theranostics uh, committee. And he's done some fascinating work. Can you give us an update on maybe state of play in Korea, access to Lutetia, uh, PSMA Theranostics at the moment? Yes, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'd like to summarize the uh, status of the Korea of the PSMA treatment. Uh, the lutetium, uh, it is uh, now the uh, the Plubicto is not approved in uh, Korea yet. However, uh, in uh, in Korea there are uh, two two companies of the radio pharmaceutical companies. So we are doing uh, in in South Korea. Uh, it is now in the stage of the phase two clinical trials, and also it shows also very. Uh, nice uh, treatment response. So hopefully yeah, in near future, uh, I also expect to uh, probably uh, they will be uh, approved by the Korean FDA. And another issue is uh, one of the problem is uh, the Korea FDA is a little bit uh, show some tight regulation for the kind of some uh, radio pharmaceuticals. So in South Korea, uh, it is not allowed to uh, produce in kind of some homebrew uh, radio pharmaceuticals. So it is not possible to uh, making uh, our own. Uh, although in our the technology of the nuclear medicine in South Korea is quite uh, enough to do that things. But so that is one of the hurdles to we need to overcome in this situation. Yeah, this... I like that homebrew of yeah. pharmaceuticals. We've What's got... our homebrew? <laughs> well, we've got a question oh. on it. <laughs> Which PSMA ligand is most accessible for patient treatment in your practice or country? And it's PSMA 617, which is, uh, you know, marketed by Novartis's Plovicto, PSMA INT, of which there's a few different formulations from some commercial companies in the US, but also available as homebrew, a little bit like the coffee we have in the morning. <laughs> uh, Actinium-225, lots of interest in alpha. Uh, I, I, uh, I think, Ilham, you're doing some great work with alphas in Korea. And maybe some medical oncologists just refer for PSMA and they don't even know what, what, the, which, difference is. what the difference is or if there is a difference. Uh, and it probably varies a lot according to regulatory mm. uh, approval. Uh, so this is a really... Interesting question, and the results are also very interesting. I'll end the poll. Uh, there's about 100 people that voted on that, and 70% use Aplovicto, which actually surprises me because I know that's the dominant answer in the USA, mm. uh, where Plovicto is registered, approved, and now reimbursed, and also in our center at Peter Mac, where we use you know, predominantly PSMA 617, thanks to access from Novartis, but around Asia, I know there's a lot of INT in use in India and Singapore mm -hmm. and other countries. So given this Asian focus, I, was, I thought we'd see a lot more INT use, uh, but in fact, we don't. And no one answered actinium. So people aren't using actinium mm -hmm. first line, which is good. So, you know, it's interesting um, at ASCO GU, um, I don't know, Michael, if you heard, there was a, there was a talk um, about how uh, beta emitters are in fact not the best agent for treating micrometastases. And in fact, something like actinium or radium would be better. What are your thoughts on that? We might segue to a panel member from Japan who's got that. some That's... expertise in really novel alpha emitters, I think. Uh, Professor Seigo Kinua, 
Panazawa. From Panazawa. Yeah. Unfortunately, there's uh, been a very bad earthquake in Japan yeah, a few just weeks ago. Yeah, the start of January. And uh, we were sorry to hear that you were really personally affected by that. So, our, you know, we really send all our condolences to people who, who you know, were affected. I think there were many deaths in in Japan and uh, even your house had a, had, a, had a lot of damage, I think. Uh, so, firstly, just acknowledging the challenging times and, and thank you for joining in this challenging time. Yeah, it's good for me. And uh, uh, as uh, Michael already told you, that the, the Japanese people, a number of Japanese people are killed by the earthquake. And then now it's a stage for the uh, restoring the damaged areas just close to Kanazawa, my place. Anyway, uh, my friends and my families are all okay. And then uh, we are peacefully living now. And uh, I think uh, I got a very tough question <laughs> from <laughs> your side. <laughs> and, uh, perhaps you know the Japanese community, I mean, Osaka University, friends in Osaka are trying to use Actinium 211 and love the OS PSMA. And the clinical trial is going to start, let's say, in a few months, I guess. And then the reason why the Japanese community is keen to as asserting 211 is the difficulty to uh, obtaining the actinium 225 in my country. Anyway, uh, Osaka and Fukushima University also has a uh, actinium, uh, no, no, not actinium, uh, asserting 211. And then now the Japanese community is uh, thinking to built a kind of big accelerator to get a more amount of astatine to 11. So the, uh, the way of Japanese uh, uh, people are just a little bit different from the way in the world. However, the of course, the Japanese researchers and Japanese doctors are looking for the uh, actinium to 25 for the uh, breast cancer. So the, uh, I would say we are just watching what will go on for the uh, distribution of up to 25 in the world. Fantastic. Japan has really been a leader in nuclear medicine in the 80s and 90s with the uh, evolution of PET. There are more cyclotrons in Japan than mm -hmm. most other countries and uh, actually many more PET scanners than most other countries and uh, a lot of the pioneering work uh, early in PET has been uh, done in Japan. So we look forward to seeing your new accelerator and uh, being uh, formed. And maybe you can lead the world in alpha and astatine and some really novel nuclear medicine approaches. Before we go to the audience Q&A, Renu, there's one more panel member from Vietnam, a more developing country that we haven't introduced. Uh, that's... Uh, Dr. Son, uh, known as Alex to us. He came and visited us in Peter Mac for a few months Excellent. and uh, I had the pleasure to visit his center in in Ho Chi Minh. And uh, again, when he came to visit us at Peter Mac a few years ago, we were doing PSMA PET CTs and he took that back and I think established maybe the first gallium 68 generator in, in Vietnam and is now doing our PSMA PET. So I'm pleased that PSMA PET's now available in Vietnam. Can you give us a, a bit of a feel for access to both PSMA PET and also to PSMA therapy in Vietnam today? Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. I'm happy to be here and um, sharing our status. Um, actually, uh, Vietnam is a developing country, so we meet many problems with um, funding and also uh, administrative uh, process. Uh, in our country now, um, that's uh, only um, PSMA uh, gallium 68 for diagnostic was uh, approved in uh, Ho Chi Minh City, Chore Hospital uh, since uh, December 2023, 20, uh, so uh, just uh, two months ago. Um, about uh, PSMA uh, ther therapy, um, uh, 
it's still be uh, quite far uh, for future uh, because uh, of uh, funding and also because of uh, many uh, documentative um, uh, process. Uh, we, we need to overcome it. So uh, in my hospital, actually, uh, we already uh, uh, have a generator also uh, modal statistics for PSMA and also uh, Dota TED. Uh, we also uh, submit uh, documents uh, to the hospital and um, uh, uh, how uh, administer traders. Uh, but um, we, we we need to uh, wait for the uh, approval. So uh, our uh, solutions for uh, for some issues uh, are maybe uh, strengthen our uh, relationship and uh, try to uh, catch up uh, the trend of uh, Theranostic uh, in over the world. And also uh, call the funding for uh, uh, research and also maybe clinical trial from government and also IEA. So now, I think I there are tremendous opportunities uh, in Vietnam and throughout Asia. Going to Vietnam, it's, it's really an eye-opener, uh, really uh, accelerating very quickly. And we now, might move to some of the questions yeah. uh, coming through. Some Just before we do, oh, yeah. a little advertorial. Oh, yes. Uh, we need for Prostic 24. Absolutely. Yeah, it's coming up. It's every two years, and this is our second one. And it's shaping up to be a fantastic meeting. Uh, we've got Ken Herman as our special guest, amongst other incredible guests. We have a lot of overseas invited speakers uh, listed here. I won't go through them all, uh, including Mike Sategi from South Africa, who's recently published a big uh, paper on actinium PSMA in Lancet Oncology, uh, and uh, many other people. This is really a teaching course. It's two days. First day is focused on PSMA imaging, and then the second day on uh, PSMA therapy and uh, there's still time to register. So go to porostic24.org. Uh, it's being held outside of Peter Mac in a hotel that's recently been renovated that has conferences facilities. So it's going to be a great visit to Melbourne as well for those who do want to uh, come. There is still time to register. I think we have over 250 people registered already, but there is room for more. So that's coming up in mid-March, 14th to 16th of March. And so. it's in person only. We're not going to do virtual like this. We want a face-to-face. -face. Oh, so if you don't attend, you miss out. Yeah. Now to questions. Yeah, so thanks to everyone who sent through some questions. We'll start working through the list. So the first one uh, from Alan White is uh, about using PSMA, lutetium PSMA even earlier. So not even in the hormone sensitive space, but before the prostate's even been removed. So the locally advanced setting uh, and wondering if this is a potential approach. And I might ask our expert on this topic, <laughs> uh, Dr. Renu Epen. Uh, this question is from Alan White, who's a great friend of the podcast. So hello, Alan, and uh, thank you for joining us. And thanks for the question. Um, yes, yeah, so we, we recently published the lutectomy trial, which is the earliest use of lutetium PSMA in the upfront setting prior to radical prostatectomy in men with high risk um, localized prostate cancer. Um, and again, we used a PSMA uh, SCV max cutoff of 20. Um, and we really were looking at uh, dosimetry, so how much dose of radiation we could actually get into tumors expressing PSMA. Um, and it was about it was about 20 gray to the prostate itself, a median dose, and a median dose of almost 38 gray to the lymph nodes. Um, and, uh, you know, the other, it was a phase one trial, so it was really looking at uh, the safety of the treatment as well. And, uh, you know, lutetium PSMA was tolerated very well, um, one to two cycles uh, prior to surgery. And for us surgeons, one of the real pressure points here was how difficult would the prostatectomy be uh, after lutetium PSMA? And we were pleasantly surprised to see that it, it really didn't make it that much more difficult. I mean, these are advanced cases anyway, but it, it didn't add um, much in terms of difficulty. So a uh, really interesting trial. And I think one of the most interesting aspects of it um, will be some of the translational work we do. I mean, we're using a lot of lutetium PSMA, but we don't really know how it affects the prostate cancer tumor microenvironment which is traditionally thought to be a very cold environment. So how these treatments actually work and uh, whether they have an effect on systemic immunity is yet to be seen. So I think some of this work will be really interesting. So, so Oliver said earlier that, you know, patients don't like 
uh, ADT, hormone treatment, and they don't like chemotherapy, so we need to move the envelope earlier. But patients don't like prostatectomies either, do they? They love it. Oh, they do. They do. <laughs> but do you see this as a possible replacement in the future? Declan Murphy did a great talk on surgical obsolescence. It's on GU Cast. I would recommend that episode. I think I remember it said on Noosa Beach. It's a fantastic episode. Do you think... Uh, one day you might use this instead? Oh, look, it's that's a difficult question to answer. And I think, you know, we, we need more trials to, to know for sure. I, I think at this point in time, uh, we really can't say that. I mean, the surgery is still here to stay, but um, I think a synergistic effect would be really interesting. It would be the nuclear surgeons. <laughs> we already are, Jane. <laughs> Speaking of uh, treatment side effects, I think there was a question about darolutamide, and, which is generally better tolerated than enzalutamide and whether we'd see the same effect, uh, the same synergism with lutetium PSMA. So I might direct that to you, Louise. Do you think that the clonal expansion you discussed is a, a class effect for novel hormonal agents or is it something specific to enzalutamide? No, so there's definitely publications in um, abiraterone as well that show that um, you get the same effect. Uh, so I would say it's a class effect. And I agree, running the ENZO, ENZO P trial, enzalutamide causes mild cognitive impairment in a proportion of patients. It causes significant fatigue in about 15% of patients. And a lot of those other uh, ARSIs are actually better tolerated. So I think it's a class effect. Thanks, what? Louise. We might just go to the questions that have the highest upwards and then work Sounds down the list. Good. Yeah. This is the top one. The top one is from an anonymous attendee. Do we let anonymous people ask questions? We do. We do. We do. Would you recommend F18 PSMA PET to assess eligibility for lutetium as opposed to gallium 68? Uh, and if you're using F18, uh, is the liver uptake a problem, high versus low? Some have suggested using the spleen. How do you deem suitability? Maybe uh, that's a good question. To answer that question. Maybe uh, anyone from our panel. How about Su Ping, can you answer that question? Oh, Gallium versus fluorine. Yeah. So in Singapore, we don't have the fluorine, so it's mainly gallium <clears throat> PSME eleven. So I mean, I do understand why the question was asked because for some fluorine PSME precursors such as one zero zero seven. It's predominantly excreted by the liver. So uh, whether you can use that as a threshold uh, for uh, eligibility criteria for treatment, uh, I mean, I don't really know the answer, but I would think for fluorine 18 DCFPYL, that would be okay because it's fairly comparable uh, with the gallium version of PSME 11. Oliver Sato, I wonder if you can answer. I know in when uh, Plavicta was approved, there was some controversy because the FDA approval was really linked to the gallium 68, uh, but many places are using uh, DCFPYL. Uh, Oliver, in the US, uh, is DCFPYL acceptable to insurance companies or are some rejecting that? It, it is. It's, it's uh, initially, Michael, there was some pushback, but right now, we have what we call the NCC and guidelines. Premier says either one. Let me draw the distinction between gallium 68 and F18 with regards to the ligand, because PSMA 11, DCF, PYL, we're fine. 1007 is a different beast, and there it is not analogous. And so 1007, you could not use the same threshold because of the liver uptake. So, bottom line, uh, depends on the ligand, but in the U.S., DCFPYL, F18, and gallium 68, PSMA 11, all the same. I think that's an important update. Uh, one, I don't like hearing F18 versus gallium 68 because we really need more detail. There's multiple F18 ligands. Yeah. Uh, and actually, we publish, we use both at Peter Mac, both DCFPYL and gallium 68, and we think they're really very equivalent. And in fact, since we've done so many of both over the last 10 years, we did a paper in patients that had had both traces. Maybe they had DCFPOL to start with and they came back and had a gallium and we compared the physiologic uptake and it was pretty much identical between the two traces. And this was actually a fellow project and it's cited in the NCCN guidelines to support the use of DCFPYL for selection uh, of Plavicta. So very proud of that little paper. 
Speaking of different ligands, when we think about the different PSMA ligands, there's another question for you, Oliver, uh, with regards to some of the PSMA monoclonal antibody ligands available, such as J591. Uh, and I guess the question is, what are your thoughts about using uh, either lutetium or actinium combined with these monoclonal antibodies for uh, microscopic disease in prostate cancer following uh, stereotactic radiotherapy? Yeah, so that's a very specific question about post-SPRT. And I think that alpha is why I could be a little better. You know, if you look at the crossfire required with a beta, it really is not optimal for single cells or very small cell clusters. I think the alpha is going to be better than the beta in that small sort of microscopic disease setting. But let's be very careful. We don't really know without the experiment having been done. And the, the question started off with J591 and antibodies, and then it ended up with SBRT. And there might be more than one way to look at this. And I think we're going to need to prove that the antibodies really work in a randomized trial. We got a little bit here, a little bit there, but no definitive studies. We need definitive studies to be able to draw conclusions. There's another question on the role of SBRT, uh, referring to the other to, to your study where it's in the standard of care arm. And the question is, well, is SABER a standard of care for oligometastatic metastatic disease? Well, it's a great question. I think it's a standard of care. I don't necessarily think that there is the standard of care. There's some people who prefer hormones. There's some people who don't. I think if you talk to patients, they often prefer not to be treated with the hormones. So I think it is a standard of care, but it's not necessarily the standard of care. By the way, it was acceptable to the FDA. This has gone through the FDA. So I'll simply say, we'll let others decide. In the end, if we have a positive trial, I think it'll be very popular. And another question for you, Oliver. You're very popular. Most of the questions are directed towards you. You'll be pleased to know. The question is whether in that study you need to be M1 positive on conventional imaging or can it be defined on the PSMA PET CT? No, the eligibility criteria is very, very clear. Let's start with the endpoint. MFS, conventional imaging endpoint. That means you can have no conventional imaging metastases at baseline. You need to transition from one state to another. So to get in the trial, PSMA PET, conventional imaging negative. Progression is conventional imaging positive, metastatic disease, prostate cancer working group three. So that's what allows the FDA approval to occur because we're transitioning into a new state. And MFS, conventional imaging, is an approvable endpoint. No doubt about it. There's a question from Mauritius. Okay, let's hear it. They're about to submit a Theranostics project to the public health system, and they would like to know where can they get their lutetium PSMA from? Where can they get their brew? Yeah. <laughs> their home brew. It's a good question. We've got Dr. Buteau here. We haven't... Yeah, we haven't introduced Dr. James Buteau, who's uh, been here, and uh, James is a nuclear medicine physician at Peter Mac. He's a PCF one, PCF young investigator. Um, James, do you have some spare homebrew to spare? Well, actually, I have some in our garage. Oh, so great. it depends. Uh, yeah, we can have a chat. Uh, I guess wherever you can get it, good to have a few contacts in case there are, you know, we have Isotopia in Israel, for example. We get some from Ansto. Uh, we have several different nuclear reactors across the world that you can uh, source it from and always good to have a bit of redundancy uh, to avoid uh, any logistic issues and uh, you know delaying treatments for patients. What are some of the challenges with exporting, importing lutetium PSMA? Importing and exporting. Um, yeah, I mean we get, I guess we've had some quite interesting challenges just with the Terbium 161 it comes all across from Israel, sent to the States, sent back to Israel, sent to Australia. Uh, so I think that just getting through customs, having some good contacts that can uh, help fly it through a lot more seamlessly, um, that's probably one of the one of the key key issues to getting it there on time for the patients. Actually, now that you do mention Terbium, uh, you should give us a quick update on the Violet trial because I mean that's that's a very cool trial, and we've treated some of the 
first patients in the world. It is, yeah, the first uh, almost 30 patients. Uh, so it's a very interesting trial. I think the, it does touch on micrometastases. So you do have micrometastases that can be they're energy sheltered from normal lutetium PSMA. So when you get down to those last few cells, most of it travels, you know, 50, 90 prostate cancer cells in diameter. Uh, lut uh, terbium 161 is a bit like an enhanced version of lutetium. Uh, it's like setting off these deadly firecrackers in the prostate cancer cells. So you can really hit those little micromets and hopefully this will lead to more durable responses. So this is my nuclear medicine physician coming out. This is the beta emitter and it emits OG electrons, Yes, correct? OG and conversion yeah. as well. I learned that at the plastic <laughs> preceptorship. <laughs> uh, fantastic, James. Thank you. Another little advert, um, uh, the APCCC. Welcome and hello to all the participants of Prostic. We really hope to see you also in beautiful Lugano for APCCC 2024, end of April. And our ladies will tell you who will be there and what we will be talking about. You can see in the background the map that shows where all the experts for APCCC 2024 will come from. But APCCC is also open for all participants, not restricted only to the experts. And we will target everything from locally advanced prostate cancer to the very advanced stages. And of course, we will discuss a lot about PSMA for diagnostics and treatment. So hope to see you all there and um, see you soon. See you soon. Thank you. That's uh, at the end of April in beautiful Lugano in Switzerland. Um, it's, in my opinion, probably the best prostate cancer meeting. Uh, Second to the PCF meeting only. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's still time to register. It's uh, the 25th to the 27th of April, I believe. Um, and uh, several of the people here today are panelists um, for the APCCC. Um, and a lot of the difficult questions will be, will be answered. It's a really good meeting because a panel puts together around 100 questions. But these are not simple questions. These are controversial questions, areas of uncertainty, areas where there is no clinical guideline uh, that is definitive because a trial hasn't been done to answer the question because you can't do a phase three trial answering every question. So it may be, would you give lutetium PSMA to someone with a GFR of 30 mils per minute? And then they take votes from an expert panel. And if over, I think, 70% of the panel vote in favor of one answer, then there's deemed to be a consensus and that forms then a manuscript which has these consensus guidelines so I think it's very valuable for all these tricky questions but the conference itself is fantastic yeah. we might go back to the questions so a few um, more questions there's a few more questions for you Oliver so a couple of people have actually asked about the PSMA, PSMA 4 study and the current overall survival data I know it's immature at the moment but uh, as you said, over 80% of patients did cross over, which is likely impacting on the overall survival results so far, but the hazard ratio does cross one. So what are your thoughts on, on why that is? And I suppose, is there anything you think could have been done differently with the, tri with the trial? Um, and uh, I guess, do you, uh, is there anything, um, I guess any caveats or how would you like to explain the overall survival uh, if it does end up not being significant when we do have an RPFS benefit? Yeah, so so a couple of questions that are on there. So number one is we do have a crossover adjusted overall survival analysis presented at Madrid. I just left it off. That's 0 0.80. So that does go the right way, number one. Number two, I think confidence intervals really need to be taken seriously. You know, medians are actually point estimates. And if we look at that 1.16, that is a point estimate with some pretty damn big confidence intervals built around it. So as we get a little more maturity, I think we're going to end up having smaller confidence intervals. It may drift back into a more favorable less than one range. I don't know, or maybe it'll just just end up right around one. But I think that's a consequence of the crossover. Now, one question I think that is legitimate, and this is some a question I've been posed here and there, is, is there the potential for harm to occur to the tissue-treated patients 
after the protocol is completed. We looked at the adverse event rate. It's fabulous. It really is. But what about downstream effects? What about harming chemotherapy in the future? Maybe the patients can't get their docetaxel, cabazitaxel, at the same dose and schedule that they would have without the lutetium. That could have an impact. I'll simply say, immature data, big confidence intervals. Let's look at it with a more mature analysis. I'll tell you my opinion when I know a little more. It won't be that much longer. Unfortunately, these people, uh, these patients are uh, expiring because of the lack of effective therapies. Underlining a critical, critical issue. We need better therapies for this disease. Metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer, it's fatal. Now, there's been a lot of other questions in the chat. I don't think we're going to get to them all. And there's also a lot on NZP. And Louise Emmett's been kind enough to be tapping away, actually answering them. Uh, in the chat, so we can try and save those and, and share them. Absolutely. Um, and uh, we should actually go back to, before we wrap up, we should um, uh, go back to Andrea and see if she has any closing words before we thank everyone. I just want to say thank you to again to the Peter Mac team and to all the panelists. I learned so much and I think it's it's such a great thing to see Prostic, you know, doing such international efforts. Um, we, we all want to see, you know, these therapies being used appropriately all over the world. So thank you again. And I look forward to hearing about the preceptorship. Fantastic. Thank you, Andrea, for joining us. And it's a shame that Howard Soul couldn't make it. Um, I think this might have been the, this might be the first PCF Prostic webinar that he's missed, but we've certainly missed him uh, and we send him our best. And also a big thank you to Declan Murphy, who's, you can't see it because he's hiding in the shadows in the room. Maybe if we turn the cameras somehow, we can we can see him uh, on the edge, but he's been, con there, oh, there, there he is. <laughs> he's been controlling all the whiz bang equipment. I don't know how he does it, but I suppose it's not that much different than robotic surgery. <laughs> So uh, if you do want to check back on any of this content, we will be posting this um, as a special GUcast episode. So in the next few days, it'll be out. So please do uh, have a listen. Please subscribe, rate us, like us, uh, send us your suggestions and feedback. Thanks to all the panel members from around Asia for joining. What a fantastic and, group we had. And thanks to the International Cancer Imaging Society for co-hosting. Don't forget the ICIS meeting in Singapore. Absolutely. Um, and a special thanks also to Oliver Sartor and Louise Emish for their fantastic talks today. And Louise and James in the studio. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Michael. It's been great. It's been wonderful. We'll have to do it again. And see you next time for another webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.